buckle your seatbelt and hang on to your St. Christopher. The film shows off on a wild ride. Up ahead, we shall find sex and murder, addicts and vampires. There's a deep, dark wood and a lake to swim in. But I fear that not everyone is going to get out alive. Coming up on this week's show, Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston play elegantly wasted bloodsuckers in Only Lovers Left Alive. Colin Farrell and Jennifer Connelly provide the fairy dust and tinsel in A New York Winter's Tale. And the naked men are cruising for a killing in the French thriller Stranger by the Lake. First up, there's the small matter of Nymphomaniac Volumes 1 and 2, a four-hour sexual odyssey from the Danish director Lars von Trier. I'm not sure we've mentioned this one before, but it's high time we did. The film stars Charlotte Gansburg and Stacey Martin as the nymphomaniac and Stellan Skarsgård as her confessor. And I met up with the cast over in snowy Copenhagen. The sex wasn't hard. For me, it was all the masochistic scenes was, yes, embarrassing, a little humiliating. The blowjob, the same thing, a bit humiliating too. Um, and then having a, you, you can't see it in the four hour version, but having a prosthetic uh, vagina put in. So two hours in the morning with someone working down there and not being able to pee for hours. That was the hard part. <laughs> if you have to talk, remember to ask lots of work questions if you want more than a yes or no answer. That all just happen its own. You just take them to the lavatory and you have sex with them. What if it's nasty? Then you just think of the bag of chocolate sweeties. What kind of relationship did you have with your porn double? I didn't really have one. Um, <laughs> She was called Cindy, and I think she's an actual porn star in Germany. And, and I would do my thing, get out, and she would do her thing. Um, and then that was pretty much it. You didn't criticise each other's performances? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think I could stay, because you're, you're doing a scene and then suddenly it switches and everyone's doing their own thing and it does become a porn set. And then I just start getting really uncomfortable and I'm like, Okay, I think I'm gonna go, guys. I'm just gonna have a cup of tea. Perhaps the only difference between me and other people was that I've always demanded more from the sunset. More spectacular colors when the sun hit the horizon. That's perhaps my only sin. With the character of Joe, did you feel at times that you were playing Lars von Trier? There's, there's a sort of uh, an assumption that all mm. these characters are kind of facets of, of himself. Yeah, and I think he told me that. He said, you know, you are to a certain extent playing me, and that's an honor. Um, it's quite a big challenge because he, he is so incredible. But it, he gives you all these little clues in the script that you sort of end up surfing. Just room for two more on the couch and my cup runneth over because it's Peter Bradshaw <laughs> and Catherine Shord. Peter, I know you've had issues with I Lars von Trier in the past. I have. What has he got to do to convince you? He's got to produce a film like this. I think for the very first time, I've really, really liked and enjoyed and got behind a Lars von Trier film. I think it's because it's had a genuine sense of humour for the really quite unsuspected sense of humour for me. I've always thought that before, I thought Lars von Trier was a typical practical joker or prankster, somebody who doesn't really have a sense of humour but likes playing a practical joke on his audience. And I've always thought that in the past, he, almost all of his films, even the very best ones, have been sort of custard pies in our face, to be honest. Brilliant custard pies, but custard pies. Whereas this one, I think, has something else. I love the relationship between Charlotte Gainsbourg and Stellan Skarsgård. I love that kind of comedy, kind of odd couple effect mm. they have. I love the way Charlotte Gainsbourg's voice gets more and more kind of annoyed and irritated at his ridiculous uncomprehending digression, the way he will go on about J.S. Bach or fly fishing or the Fibonacci sequence. And she listens deadpan and says, that's your most ridiculous digression yet. <laughs> like that. But then he's annoyed by her yeah. coincidences. Yes. He keeps saying that would never happen. That's so, another yes. coincidence. And it's like sort of playing all these kind of weird games yes. within the narrative. But 
I, again, it's, it's kind of funny. It snaps back and forth. I like the fact that she's almost trying to freak him out, trying to epa him a little bit, and he mm. just never is because he's such a sort of... Is he the holy fool or the village idiot? I don't know. But whatever it is, there's some sort of chemistry there. Something is happening which is quite interesting. I like the fact she doesn't consider herself a sex addict in the banal, normal sense, mm. but in the uh, rather heightened kind of porn literature sense of being a nymphomaniac, mm. entirely preposterous. And she and loves rather, her filthy and She loves lust. her degradation. I mean, it's such an outrageous male writer's conceit, the woman you know, dim, nympho. I mm. mean, that's such a sort of porn conceit. And perhaps only Lars von Trier could have got away with the outrageousness of giving it to her and shoving it down her throat. Catherine, do you think it's a male writer's conceit? Um, yeah, I think it's a Lars von Trier conceit, which is a specific thing and, and something which I very much enjoy as well. I think it is a joke. I think it is a practical joke in that it's being sold um, by him, you know, even though he's not speaking, but by, by everything about it as a very sexy film. And in fact, it's the opposite of that. <laughs> yeah. You called it a four hour cold shower. It really you? is, yeah. It mm. really is. And so it's be interesting to see how the takings for the first one and the second one differ. Mm. So I think a lot of people go to the first one thinking, oh, four. Yeah, so and actually, Whoa. <laughs> the first one is actually more doer than the, the second, yeah, I think. The second, the second kind of picks up the pace, really. It's, I don't, not sure the about second it, one is darker, though, if anything, yeah. though, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, I think it is, in terms of, but in terms of, Sort of sexiness or mm. explicitness. I'm not. I'm not sure. But this, the first one is very kind of largo. I did think watching it that it is very much the film of a great director who has shut himself off from the world, whether it's from you know as a result of Cannes or whatever. That he's locked himself away in this room yeah. and he's just kind of written in a frenzy and he's poured it all onto yes. the page. And, I, and that's sort of what's great about it, but it's also what, what makes it kind of undigestible at times, mm, too. I think it's very interesting. He suddenly, out of the blue, gives Stellan Skarsgård this very pointed stuff about how he's, he's anti-Zionist, but not anti-Semitic, you know. <laughs> uh, which, incidentally, Lars, is the absolute hallmark of the anti-Semite. Going on and on and on about that distinction mm. is a very worrying thing, I think. But uh, that I thought, yes, you're still, you're still hurting. You're still hurting. You're ironising it in all sorts of ways, but you're still, still hurting. But yes, I, I, I agree, yes. Catherine, you're, you're typically more of a fan of, of Lars than, than Peter is. Do, how does this measure up to Von Trier's other work? Um, it bears a lot of sort of tonal relation, I think, to things like Antichrist, particularly. Mm. For me, it's not nearly such a good film. It's not so beautiful. It's not so interesting. There's a direct reference to Antichrist. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, which no, is weird. Of, it rewrites it. it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not quite sure what he's saying there, but it is, I quite enjoyed that. Um, I think it doesn't really, I don't know, it doesn't really, it's so divorced from the real world. You know, the thing with Antichrist is it was meant to be set in America, and yet yeah, it's obviously not. And, you know, but because it was sort of such a fable, you could go with that. This takes place more in an apparent real world, but it's so, it's so alien and it's so strange. And even something like Sheila Leboeuf's accent, which I know one shouldn't sort of think about, you know, too much, but it, it's it's mimetic of the general divorce from any uh, any He's real always thing. Always been like I, I've always found that though that kind of weird Lars land where he can't. It's, it's a bit like Finland or Britain mm. or whatever. Yeah. It's this weird made up land. And again, for me, for the first time, I didn't find it jarring. I didn't find it kind of phony in mm. a way that, I mean, I, I probably was too down on Antichrist, but because as Catherine says, it is a beautiful looking film. It mm. is a brilliant, visually, it is brilliant. But it, it's kind of, uh, I still think it's annoying in a way this isn't, in a way. It still, it still has that kind of, I don't know, kind of imposture, which I don't buy in a way that this is much more kind of jokey and larky in a, in a strange way and, mm. more, and funnier. Would it be all right if I show the children the whoring bed? After all, they also had a stake in this event. You need to see it, right? Let's go see Daddy's favorite place. Come on, boys. Home. <sighs> so this is where it all happened. Lars von Trier back with a vengeance with Nymphomaniac 1 and 2. And after all that brooding threat and explicit sex, it's probably time to change the pace and lower the temperature. But not just yet. Allez, je vais me baigner. Tu viens? Le mal lac pour nous tout seuls? Bon. Il va noyer récemment ici. Stranger by the Lake is a tense, steamy thriller by writer-director Alain Giraudy. 
leading us to the far shore where a murderer stalks the happy hunting ground of a local cruising spot. Pierre de Ladonchamp is the hapless hero, torn between the angel on the beach and the monster in the depths. Bon. Catherine Menet. That's right, and you do learn a lot from these films about men, um, particularly this one, in terms of stamina. I mean, my God, <laughs> extraordinary. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting, this is a film without any women in it, none at all, maybe one in the distance at one point on a little uh, boat, mm. but that's it, which is um, interesting, but doesn't, you know, is quite a, um, location appropriate, I suppose. Um, curious in terms of Nymphomaniac, because that film is being sold a bit as quite porny, uh, and isn't, and this, although it's very explicit, whereas this is being sold as very art house and very you know respectable, uh, and is very 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 porny. I mean, I haven't seen that much gay porn, but I imagine <laughs> <laughs> that this is some. Um, you know, I watched it. I'm afraid to say uh, on my screen at work a few hours ago, <laughs> and it was it was quite the experience. Um, and there are scenes in which you can see the artistic justification for quite such a long. Uh, and quite such a close-up um, uh, scenes and then money shots. But you can also, you know, I mean, I, I mean, it is sort of thorny and the, the plot, it's very well done. It's a very good thriller and it's very sort of, it's very aesthetically great and sort of suspenseful in a Hitchcockian way. Mm. I quite liked it and it, it was definitely never bored, apart from in the sex scenes where I was a bit bored, I have to say. Um, but then the climax of it is very, um, it's very cheap, and it does make you think. I wonder if, if this is basically a kind of fig leaf, you know, a kind of uh, crimey flick fig leaf. Without, uh, without kind of wishing to draw chance of any conclusions, I did, I did get the sense that the director knows his material and this milieu. Yes, <laughs> I, I think it's fair to say that. <laughs> I, I, I love the explicit sex scenes in it. I think so many films sort of hint and sort of sidle up to mm. the subject of sex, ooh, sex, naked bodies, but lose their bottle and sort of sidle away again. And this one is saying, you know, sex, this is what we're talking about, and this, and here it is. And it was absolutely without inhibition. I, I, I thought it was great. But it's and not I, quite that simple, Peter. It's not just that it's like, this is how sex actually is. This is sex between two incredibly hot guys, yeah. you know, in paradise. It's not just kind but that's of normal what it, sex. What it always is in films. They're always hot in films. <laughs> They're always in a pleasant location. At least it's sort of taking it to the next step and saying, well, yes, all right, that's what we're talking about. The, the, here we are. The, the, it's it's explicit. That's fine. And here it is. Mm. We, it's it's about cruising. It's about se it's about anonymous sexual encounters. It's not about people having open-ended relationships and developing a, a profound relationship with each other. It's about pure sex. And this is why the crime happens. And this is why it's difficult to detect because. Cru mm. Guys who are into cruising, yeah, it's an illicit they don't. Shadow they, it's world. illicit shadow world, and they try not to remember who they've had sex with mm. in order that they can keep it fresh for the next day. Mm. They don't exchange numbers or, or email addresses, and that's what it's about. Mm. It's very different from someone like Joe Esterhaz, who sort of says, who creates a, an erotic thriller and says, "Here is a dodgy erotic mm. scene, and here is a crime that's arisen from it." And there's yeah, always something kind of that. prurient and exactly. Yeah. Like Whereas and that they're right, being punished. Yeah, they're being punished, and that's part of the dramatic excitement. Mm. Whereas this is very different. It's as if rightly or wrongly, he's says this is like an Arcadia and a crime has arisen within it. It's not, it's not like, I don't know, it's such a long time since I've seen it, but William Friedkin's film Cruising, mm. uh, where Al Pacino pretends to be gay, what a dangerous and wild thing to do, <laughs> uh, to bait the, the killer. Very, very different, really from the, uh, the kind of straight world, mm. what well, I think of, perhaps wrongly, as the Joe Esther has world. Whereas mm. this, this film, as you say, Alain Girard, clearly, as you say, is you know, something he probably does know. Inspecteur Dame Roder. Bonjour. Vous connaissiez la victime Oui, je le connaissais. Que l'un des vôtres se fasse assassiner, ça vous émeut pas plus que ça Non. Tu veux pas aller te branler ailleurs Là, on n'est pas en train de baiser, on discute, on veut pas que tu écoutes. D'accord D'accord. The Naked and the Dead in Stranger by the Lake. 
And now let's draw a veil and move on to the exotic ruins of modern America. Only Lovers Left Alive is an enticing vampire mood piece starring Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston as the creatures of the night and what beautiful music they make. My sister's looking for us. Shouldn't she be sleeping in a coffin somewhere? I'm really, really hungry. Director Jim Jarmusch spirits us from Tangier to Detroit in the company of a pair of lost souls trailing clouds of glory behind them. The music is loud and the guests are beautiful. Just please steer clear of the raspberry popsicles. Come in. Is that the really good stuff? Precisely. Typo. Negativo. My product is secret in your soul. Now, Peter, you saw this when it played at the Cannes Film Festival last year and, and didn't like it. I was sort of, yeah, I did, well, I didn't dislike it, but I, I was kind of uh, disappointed by it. But I have to admit, I have woken up to this film. I really have. When I first saw it, I found it a bit studenty and a bit, we're so cool, we're so, we're, you know, we're so kind of, we're so, I don't know, wonderful uh, and everything. And I think, still think it has touches of self-congratulation and callowness, to be honest. I mean, I think this business of, Christopher Marlowe wrote Shakespeare's plays is a very, very uninteresting and unsubversive thing to say, and unfortunately this film says it. And there are very studenty things about it which I still think ring false. Mm. For example, the thing that uh, Adam says that he talks about scientists, and his idea of a very important scientist is Tesla, which is a very, very annoying and tiresome thing to say. But my goodness, it is stylish. Mm. It really is. I mean. It and may, the style is the substance. And the style is the substance. And I think I, I really, I think I got that wrong. The whole point is, all right, style out of substance, sure. But my goodness, what style? Mm. What style? I mean, it is exquisitely made. It's beautifully made. The locations in Detroit and Tangier are just brilliantly made. Mm. I mean, it, it, it's almost heightened. It looks so good. Mm. It really does look good. And the relationship between Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston is so good and so interesting that you forget, I forgot, about their age difference. I mean, they, yeah, she's in her 40s and he's in his 20s. I mean, they could be playing mother and son. But if anything, their relationship seems almost like a sibling relationship, but a very naughty kind of Byronic mm. sibling relationship. It's very sort of sexy mm. and decadent. So I really was taken uh, taken along by it the second time in a way I, that I wasn't. I agree with you that it is like a kind of student film and it's like mm. a homage to all the things that Jarmusch kind of loves, but it's also saying this is all getting old now. This is kind of decaying. Yes. They've got all the pictures up of, you know, Iggy Pop and, yeah. you know, Joe Strummer. Joe and, Strummer. Yeah, and and oh you think God. these people are kind of dying off now. Yeah. And it's about a world, a kind of outsider art, underground, yeah. agitprop artist kind of yeah. world that, that's kind of yes. sliding off the face of the yes. map. Yes, yes, it is a bit. Uh, weirdly, I mean, it really did look like a student room for mm. me. I mean, it really reminded me of my student days. I can imagine going to see that movie, a sort of midnight movie showing mm. of that, and just loving it. Or maybe not getting it, but by golly saying that yeah. I loved and it. And a great sense of Detroit, a great use of Detroit yes. as this kind of American ghost town where yeah. it's just kind of emptied out, but it's beautiful, but it's a in Beautifully ruins. made and very well made. I thought that it was exactly the right use of it as well. I mean, you think about films like Robocop, supposedly set in Detroit, which appear to be absolutely <laughs> unaware of this mm. film, and uh, this, this city's reputation. This was absolutely right. Um, I sometimes in the past have been kind of agnostic about exactly how interesting vampirism is as a metaphor for the human condition. Mm. Sometimes I think, wow, what an interesting metaphor for the human condition. And sometimes I think, no, it's not. It's just a sort of, you know, it's just a sort of scary movie. Uh, and sometimes I think it is. I mean, it's the last scene, the last image of this film is very scary. It's mm. brilliant. Mm. Uh, it reminded me of my, one of my favorite films ever, which is Abel Ferrara's The Addiction, oh, yeah, which yeah. is a, a, a satire on vampires and vampirism, which I think is a brilliant film about, about, uh, about being undead. Uh, and this film reminded me of that in some ways. It's a, a much lighter version of that, because that Fer Abel Ferrara is a very dark and nihilistic filmmaker, and I don't think John Mush is. How can you have lived for so long and still not get it? You've been pretty lucky in love, though. If I may say so. Jim Jarmusch's lush and languorous Only Lovers Left Alive. Right, so we've had three terrific films this week. Is it greedy to ask for a fourth? This is A New York Winter's Tale, and here are its stars Colin Farrell and Jessica Brown Findlay. It's 
weeks. You have a gun? I was just robbing the place, you know? Is that still your intention? No, it isn't. Well, then, I suppose the polite thing to do would be to offer you a cup of tea. That's when you bring words like fate and destiny into it, is when almost the intellectual conceptualization of something is too big um, or too impossible because of its breadth. Yeah. Um, what they see, regardless of what their environment, I mean, they grew up in very different environments, um, one being so high society and one being the gutter. Um, and yet there is some kind of essential truth that they share or some completion of the other's heart that, um, that all that other stuff disappears. disappears, fades into the insignificance mm -hmm. that it should actually fade into continuously in many people's lives, I think. And neither of them have ever, despite being in those very opposite worlds, have ever fitted into those mm -hmm. worlds. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, when they meet, regardless of their circumstance, two quite extraordinary mm -hmm and slightly odd in a brilliant way people meet, and so it suddenly all makes sense. You steal things? I do steal things, yeah, from time to time. It wasn't always that way, though. I always wanted to be a mechanic. You know, I always had a knack for, uh, for fixing things, getting to the insides of things. What's the best thing you've ever stolen? I'm beginning to think I haven't stolen it yet. The film also has a very mystical, kind of magical element almost mm -hmm. to it. And by nature, our modern society is yeah, yeah, more yeah. cynical than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When we're um, flying on a white horse over Columbus <laughs> Circle in, you know, 2010, it's never going to be an easy pill to swallow. That's not how you got here. I was here. I was th that was real. Yeah. Yeah. No, completely. Excuse <laughs> <laughs> me of CGI next. I wasn't sitting on a barrel in a studio surrounded by green screen going like this. <laughs> With I me wasn't. laughing in the I background. Wasn't. Catherine, it's a tale of magic, but were you charmed? I was quite charmed. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to say that. <laughs> it's, it is kind of charmingly dreadful and, and quite enjoyable to watch. It's not quite the turkey it's been billed as. It is pretty, pretty atrocious, certainly a one star. But there is something charming about its earnestness. It's like a sort of got the aesthetic of a of a Athena poster from the 1980s you'd put on your wall when you're about 12. Mm. Or one of those little, you know, those little... little winky dinks. That's what, what they're called, I think. Winky dinks, where they change, the, the picture changes when you turn it. Oh, uh, possibly. Okay. I okay. was thinking of one of those little uh, bookmarks that you can get still, mm. that, you know, have like an animal, like a magic horse, like as in this one. Oh, yeah, yeah. And oh, they, yeah. they sort of go like that and it sort of flies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like totally. that. Yeah. And there's maybe some lights. <laughs> mm. um, it's like that. It's And it's great fun for that. I mean, it's good, you know, if you had some drinks, it'd be wonderful. And mm. actually, you know, seriously, I think Colin um, Farrell is not terrible in it. He's better in it than he was in Saving Mr. Banks, I thought. Although he is meant to be playing somebody of 20, mm. which, and he looked lived mm. in for a, whatever he is, 38 year old. Mm. But yeah, I mean, it's full of outrageously dreadful stuff. And it, but it, I mean, it's, its earnestness is quite charming. Did you, I mean, Catherine said a couple of drinks. How many I drinks did, would you I would need, need a couple lot, of bottles, yeah. I think, to get through this. I thought it was awful. I thought Colin Farrell was awful in it. I mean, he was every bit as bad as he was in Saving Mr. Banks. Uh, that what was terrible in it is Will Smith. Will Smith in it plays Lucifer, and he's so awful that I almost stormed out. It was just abysmal, this Com fairy tale Russell? romance. Compared to Russell. <sighs> I just, well, Russell he's, is he's, the crime kingpin. He's the crime kingpin who comes along, and he looks like doing a sort of non-singing version of Les Miserables. Mm. He comes on and sort of declaims in that sort of Irish accent. Colin is doing his Irish accent. His character's never been to Ireland. Never mind, he's doing his Irish accent. <laughs> I love the fact that he was sent, like Moses in the version, he was sent there by his parents who had turned away from New York mm. because they had TB. And his love has got TB. So it he might have given around. that TB, <laughs> the selfish sod. He's like given typhoid Mary. He is, he's the typhoid Mary of this thing. It is, there's something terrible about it, that kind of mock, Celtic kind of Tyrannogue mm. thing about his mystic white horse is just terrible. Uh, and the fact that Jennifer Connolly turns up at the mm. end, uh, that's another lost career. Christ. Uh, who turns out, and she's supposed to be, she's supposed to be the food columnist mm. on the New York Sun. 
And at the end of it, her editor says, I like your column. And she turns, she just gives her a kind of deadpan look. Say, Is that the way you treat your editor? God, you're going to get the sack. She does, she She's so cruel. Like, she says, I like recipes with pecans in them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like. Pecans? Yes. Pe no, pecans. Pecans, pecans. all right. I thought pecans. Yeah. I thought that's, that's pecans. adventurous. Or big hands. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But in it's even Murray Saint, who we should, or Saint, or Harry yeah, Potter, yeah. who we should yes. definitely mention as well. Yes, so it's yes. It's a very strange film. A film with lots of kind of Easter eggs, like the, the pecans line. It's like, yeah. Blimey. And, like and a flying horse. And a it's, flying horse. And Russell weird. is, we ought to mention that Russell is supernatural yeah. as well as all this. So he, and he, <laughs> it's a wonderful scene where he, somebody annoys him for some reason. Oh, he says he wants to eat an owl. Mm. And then the waiter says, we haven't got any. Yeah. And so he sort of bites his head bites off. His head. And in the blood does this yeah. <laughs> portrait of a woman with yeah. red hair. It's just basically, it's like I would do. With, that's like that. Well, like if you ever ate an owl. If, yeah. ever, if I ever ripped a his head off and had to do a blood, that's but, more or less what I would do. But he gives do. this to his minions and says, find, find the squirrel. And they do, they find it. <laughs> yeah, it's very good work, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, it's taken from a book, of course, a yeah. bestseller book. Mark I think Halpern. It's like a sort of very, very degraded version of John Irving. It's weird. Whoa. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's weird. But yeah. I think there is John Irving goes to Claire Accessories, Exactly, isn't it? exactly. And there is no equivalent either in the UK fiction market or indeed UK popular taste for this. There is this weird market, I think, especially in the US commercial fiction market for this strange kind of sentimental, mm. fantasy sentimental weirdness. Spiritual. Bollocks. Uh, yeah, bollocks yeah. absolute bollocks. Yeah. I've had no memory for as long as I can remember. I appreciate the help. Stories of what we did It made me think of you It made me think of you Beverly. Her name was Beverly. What's happening here? The fairy tale of New York pitches up in the drunk tank, wearing its pants on its head. And on that note, we take our leave. My thanks to Peter Bradshaw and Catherine Shord. We're back, keeping it clean, next week. <laughs>